Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. First, as is appropriate, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ngunnawal people and pay respects to elders past and present. I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, their beliefs and their relationship with the land. I also extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Tonight is a very auspicious occasion. We are going to be addressed by one of Australia's finest scholars of Chinese culture and literature, Professor Gloria Davies. Professor Davies is from Monash University. From our point of view here at the Australian Centre on China and the World, she is a very old friend, not only personally, but when the centre was invented, she was one of the first to be invited onto our national management group. So here she has seen the, the birth and the growth and the flourishing of the centre, its ups and its downs, and has been one of our most loyal and learned friends. Um, she has been a, a guiding force behind the China Story Project, behind the China Story Yearbooks, and many of the activities that we've had here in the centre. More relevant tonight, uh, Gloria is one of the world's great scholars of Lu Xun. In 2013, she published the highly acclaimed Lu Xun's Revolution, writing in a time of violence with Harvard University Press. Um, it received accolades from, um, from scholarly journals, reviews, and also in those learned uh, papers such as the Times Higher Education Supplement. It's uh, a fine book and um, Gloria is a terrific scholar. So I'm uh, really very pleased to be able to introduce her to a larger audience to deliver this public lecture, Hearing Voices with Lucia. It's an absolute pleasure to be at the ANU, my alma mater. This is where I began reading Lu Xun, in fact. So um, the paper that I'm going to be presenting tonight is part of um, new research that I've taken up this year, drawing on some of the things that I have written about Lu Xun over the years. Okay, so what do I mean by hearing voices with Lu Xun? We think of reading as a silent activity yet a great deal of sub-vocalization goes on when we read. Reflecting on inner speech as an indispensable part of reading, Robert Frost wrote in a letter in 1914, the ear is the only true writer and the only true reader. I have known people who could read without hearing the sentence sounds and they were the fastest readers, eye readers we call them, they can get the meaning by glances, but they are bad readers because they miss the best part of what a good writer puts into his work. Remember that the sentence sound often says more than the words. It may even, as an irony, convey a meaning opposite to the words. I wouldn't be writing all this if I didn't think it the most important thing I know. These remarks by Frost which I might add are abundantly quoted online, a sure sign that they resonate with a lot of people, offers us a useful way of thinking about Lu Xun's literary art specifically and the significance of sub-vocalization more generally and how we read and understand the text. So in this evening's lecture, I will argue that Lu Xun's short stories and essays suggest that he had a heightened awareness of writing and reading as involving both vi visual and auditory senses. I will argue that the evocative power of his writing, writings owes in large part to his talent for hearing voices distinctly, enabling him to then transpose the voices he heard into writing. In this connection, I will also suggest that even though Lu Xun never wrote about the phenomenon of sub-vocalization per se, he was evidently interested in its effects, 
and that several of his compositions indicate that he regarded his own inner voice as, by turns, a source of positive guidance and a form of unwanted possession. To dwell on the voices projected out of Lu Xun's writings is especially pertinent in relation to his Bai Hua Wen writings, to his modern experimental uh, written vernacular. Bai Hua Wen, as a language that Lu Xun helped to pioneer as a literary medium in the mid to late 1910s, was promoted as a literary revolution quite explicitly, that would render obsolete the pre-modern literary language of classical Chinese of China's educated elite, Wen Yan Wen. And Bai Hua Wen's producers had hoped to make written Chinese indistinguishable from spoken Chinese to equip the citizens of the modern Chinese Republic founded in 1912 with a national mother tongue in which to express their everyday experience. And of course, this was the great ideal. Bai Hua Wen's producers dreamt of a democratic language and a language of the masses. The voices Lu Xun projected out of his Bai Hua, Wen, Bai Hua Wen writings register his hopes, fears, and disappointments with this literary enterprise. Lu Xun's Bai Hua Wen writings are by no means easy to read, as Zhu Yarun in this afternoon's symposium uh, discussed and um, very convincingly um, drawing on the comments of um, people who read Lu Xun at school. And um, that was the saying that Ya Yun um, quoted. The three things we dread are classical Chinese, uh, composition, and Zhou Shuren, which is Lu Xun's birth name, given name. Uh, he didn't use the pen name Lu Xun until 1918. He was born in 1881. So this saying is the result of people having first encountered Lu Xun's writings, and particularly his short stories, as prescribed textbook readings. In other words, as texts that you never wanted to read and you never asked for. To read Lu Xun, to pass a test in Chinese language and literature is very different from reading Lu Xun for pleasure or as part of one's scholarly practice. Textbook readings, when they are badly put together, impede reading. And the multiple choice example that Ya Yun gave this afternoon, I thought was just absolutely wonderful. It just demonstrates that point. You, you don't see any Lu Xun in it at all. Right, it's just a case of identifying Kong Yi Qi according to the, the textbook requirements. Um, the chosen text, in terms of you know a badly put together textbook, right, is instrumentalized as an object of instruction through set forms of analysis and summary. By confining the reader to the task of reproducing an institutionally approved account of what a story like The New Year's Sacrifice or The True Story of RQ means, the study guide or Cliff's, Cliff's Notes approach actively discourages the reader from reading the work independently. Only slow reading independently pursued affords us the relative silence in which to hear Lu Xun's writerly voice and the many voices projected out of that writerly voice. In my referring to Lu Xun's writerly voice, you may ask, is this author's voice singular? Does he, and he's in the present tense for me as a voice, does he or did he, the historical author, have different voices contingent on genre and subject matter? And my answer to you would be both yes and no. Lu Xun's Bai Hua Wen voice is recognizably his own, even when it is used to channel other voices. And this is very clear in his use of vocabulary, the prosody, the, the style of um, his formulations. In contrast, the far more rule-bound, archaic language of his Gu Wen poetry, and he wrote in Gu Wen, uh, and his early Gu Wen essays project 
sentence sounds, to recall Robert Frost's word, that being highly formal and conventional accommodate far fewer personal or individual traits. And in saying this, I hasten to add that I'm not suggesting that his Gwen writings lack originality, for their contents are highly original. In fact, like many other types of Gwen writing, um, because the form of Gwen is constitutively restrictive, it serves to heighten by contrast the individuality or the originality of the content, right? And, and Wernie Dwar, in one instance, described that as sort of, you know, dancing and fetters. Shortly, I want to discuss a few of the voices that haunt my readings of Lu Xun. But first, I want to say a bit about listening or hearing. And there is a difference between the two that I will come to later as a topic of intellectual inquiry. The last two decades or so have seen an increasing focus on voice in literary scholarship. Voice is a complex and problematic category, to quote Richard Axel, because it is an entity attributed to silent written text. And this is um, an article in a 1998 special issue in New Literary History on voice. Moreover, and here I'm quoting Richard Axel, the question of who speaks in narrative discourse invites the further question of whether texts can really be said to speak at all. And if so, what are the theoretical motivations and implications of the metaphor of speech for writing? End of quote. Reading speech as a metaphor for writing allows Axel to sidestep the question of whether and how inner speech might affect how a reader learns to recognize an author's voice. Axel's article, published in 1998, predated by more than a decade the findings of neuroscience researchers on sub-vocalization. Using fMRI magnetic resonance imaging and eye-tracking technology to examine brain activity patterns produced during reading, these researchers have found compelling evidence of the auditory phenomenon of inner speech or the inner voice. Describing reading as, I quote, a multimodal mental experience involving both auditory and visual modalities, they are neuroscience researchers. The co-authors of a well-known 2012 article titled, How Silent is Silent Reading? Interests cerebral evidence for top-down activation of temporal voice areas during reading, that's the title, um, report that our experience of hearing our own inner voice pronouncing words mentally shows up on fMRI scans as, quote, increased metabolic activity in the auditory cortex, including voice selective areas. And more importantly, for my purposes, they also noted that Sustained inner voice activation is not an automatic process occurring systematically in response to any written word. It is clearly enhanced when participants read attentively to understand and memorize sentences and minimize when words are not processed attentively. This neuroscience evidence for Robert Frost's claim a century earlier that bad readers are eye readers, allows us to now more fully consider what it means to hear Lu Xun's voice when we read his Bai Hua Wen writings. To begin with, when I say that I hear Lu Xun's voice, it is in fact my inner voice that I hear, sounding the sentence as I read. I can't distinguish between the tonality or the sound quality of this inner voice in my head and the one in which I rehearse arguments and excuses, make plans or tell myself off in my head for a whole range of situations daily encountered. Yet in the act of reading, the words on the page acquire a phonic presence that takes over my inner voice. And at this point, let me quote Stephanie Bishop because she is very eloquent on this experience. So this is Stephanie Bishop's voice talking about her inner voice. It is not another voice that I hear when I read, but my own inner voice heard back to me. My inner voice is subject to the architecture of the author's voice, 
The voice that I hear when I read is my inner voice reshaped by the features of the text. The written words sculpt my inward hearing of myself. It is not a fictional voice that I hear when I read, but a new and adapted experience of my own inner voice. And so ends the introduction of my lecture. And I will now proceed to discuss hearing voices with Wushun in three sections. The first is titled Heteronomy, Obeying Another's Voice. In 1922, Lushun likened his Bai Hua Wen stories to acts of calling out Na Han, which was the title. And there it is, that's from one of the early editions of Na Han in the 1920s. Um, the title that he gave to his very first anthology of short stories. In the 1922 preface to this anthology, he figured China as a hermetically sealed iron house doorless and windowless, whose sleeping inhabitants were consigned to death by suffocation. I think most of you here um, are familiar with that story. His close friend Tian Xuanzong had invited him to write for Xin Qingnian, New Youth Magazine, the leading vehicle for the Bai Hua movement at the time. Lu Xun replied that the Chinese were imprisoned by the millennia-old ideas of dynastic China, and he asked Qian, should the wakeful attempt to rouse the sleeping to alert them to the agony of irrevocable death as opposed to allowing them to die in peaceful ignorance. Qian's response was, but if a few wake up, you can't say there's no hope of destroying the tie wu, right, the iron house. Lu Xun credited Qian with persuading him to call out na han, to urge for radical change. By the time he wrote this preface, Lu Xun had achieved national fame for his Bai Hua Wen's short stories and his essays. He explained his decision to continue writing in Bai Hua in the following way. And that's the Chinese there that I have emphasized. I don't have the leisure to worry whether my cry is brave and bold or sad and tragic, or whether it is repellent or ridiculous. Since this is a call to arms, I must naturally obey my general's orders. These remarks by Lu Xun on calling out revolved around the concept of voice in literature. Although he did not elaborate on what he meant by my general's orders, he nonetheless alluded to his decision to write as the result of heeding another's voice. Here, the general as a figure of military authority serves to highlight that it was in response to a commanding voice that the author wrote in Bai Hua Wen, and precisely because he felt he could not disobey this voice. It was only natural that he put aside all social anxieties of how he might sound to his readers, whether it's brave and bold or sad and tragic, repellent or ridiculous. And it was Lu Xun's way, I feel, of signaling a higher sub-vocalic authority at work in his text. Lu Xun never indicated whether his general spoke in Bai Hua Wen or Wen Yan Wen, or a mixture of both, or you know whether it had he had a Shaoxing Xiao dialect, probably did because Lu Xun had one, um, and he certainly never called it subvocalic. That's my interpretation of it. He merely noted that he was conscious of making a special effort to write positively, for this was what the commanding general of the time demanded, and hence he dared not infect his readers with his own pessimism. And he evidently liked these lines, you know, about the general's orders and the call to arms, because he repeated them again in his 1932 preface, 10 years later, to a volume of his selected writings, noting in this later work that the orders I obeyed came from the revolutionary vanguard of the time. These were orders I willingly obeyed. They were most definitely not sacred decrees, and I submitted to them neither for money nor under threat. Lu Xun's references to a commanding voice at work in his thoughts leading him to write partakes of the qualities of an interior monologue. But there is an important difference here between his, his formulations and the idea of interior monologue as a literary device. The interior monologue refers merely to the direct representation of a person's thoughts. It can but does not usually entail the idea that the thoughts that we presume to be ours 
are in fact unavoidably entangled with the thoughts of others being voiced in our heads. In this regard, Lu Xun's attentiveness to the inaudible voices that direct one's thinking, such as his general's orders, makes him, in my view, a thinker of heteronomy or counter-autonomy. He was wary of the celebratory um, claims of individualism and intellectual independence among the proponents of new culture, preferring instead to highlight the conditioned nature of people's speech and actions, not least his own. And this is very clear when you compare his writings, say, of you know, 19, the early 1920s, say, with the types of publications in which people were proclaiming, you know, de declaiming their, their creative genius and their independence, such as in, you know, the Creation Monthly, for instance. Um, so Lucian's stories and essays are written in, in ways that encourage readers to ponder the hidden authorities behind their own thinking. The workings of heteronomy, of being subjected to another's will, is perhaps most explicitly dramatized in his 1925 play script, Walker, <clears throat> The Wayfarer, in which the protagonist wayfarer feels compelled, despite exhaustion, to keep traveling toward an unknown destination because a voice up ahead is urging and summoning me to keep on going. The play features three characters, the shabbily dressed wayfarer aged between 30 and 40, and two people living in a mud hut whom he, whom he meets along the way, an old man in his 70s and a girl of 10. So all three characters are presented as age-based archetypes, the nameless. And the whole play revolves around a conversation between the wayfarer and the old man. The wayfarer discovers that the old man had also heard the same voice years earlier, but had chosen to ignore it. When the old man says, it stopped calling, and I no longer remember it clearly. The wayfarer responds, oh, how could you have ignored it? The wayfarer remarks that though his feet are bloodied and blistered, he feels compelled to obey this disembodied voice. And from a letter to his student, Zhao Qiwen, written shortly after he completed the play, we know that Lu Xun wrote The Wayfarer as an, as an allegory of his commitment to developing Bai Hua Wen for common use. As with my general's orders, the summoning voice in The Wayfarer is a source of unquestioned authority to the hero. However, as Lucian points out in relation to the old man who had stopped hearing the summoning voice, listening for utterances that strike one as true requires an effort, for one must constantly be alert to the effects of these utterances on one's ear, discriminating between what one should heed and what one should reject. And this effort of mutual discrimin of moral discrimination in turn, strikes a chord with the mention idea of knowing what to discard and what to preserve, she and chu, right? She sheng chu yi in the mentions, with the implication that someone of noble character should prefer to die rather than to lead a craven life. In Being and Time, Martin Heidegger offers us the insight that hearing is a mode of understanding. As he puts it, initially we never hear noises and complexes of sound, but the creaking wagon, the motorcycle. We hear the column on the march, the north wind, the woodpecker tapping, the crackling fire. I've given you here the characters of Xie Sheng Chu Yi, because as someone of Lu Xun's generation, steeped in the classics, you know, this, this is what they hear automatically, as clearly as one might hear the creaking wagon when you hear a particular sort of sound, right? So we hear words as sounding either familiar or foreign, and not as a multiplicity of tone data. We are constantly discriminating between sounds. 
In his writings, Lu Xun often highlighted the importance of knowing what to listen for. He likened Bai Hua Wen, in one instance, to an attempt to restore speech to this China which has been silent for centuries, suggesting that because dynastic culture had made the, China, the Chinese strangers to spontaneous expression, the success of Bai Hua Wen would be, to quote him, like ordering a, de a dead man to live again. He added that, though I know nothing of religion, I fancy this approximates, approximates to what people, to what believers call a miracle. Okay, so the remarks that I've drawn on were made by Lu Xun during a speech in Hong Kong in February 1927, which was subsequently published as Wu Sheng de Zhongguo, Voiceless China, which has more commonly been translated as Silent China, but Ted Hughes and um, this recent publication, um, called, um, uh, an anthology of trans, um, translations of Lu Xun's essays, um, Jottings Under Lamplight, has translated it very accurately, I think, captured it as voiceless China because that's what Wu Sheng means. And, and again, you know, that's the importance of translation, of listening, um, that that was what Lu Xun meant. Um, so, this was a speech, February 1927, 20, that he gave in Hong Kong, um, where he argued hyperbolically that he found it difficult to hear the real voices of flesh and blood living, breathing Chinese. He explained that China had become largely voiceless because, and here I'm going to quote him at length, using Ted Hughes' translation. Making one's ideas and feelings known to a broad audience requires writing. But as things stand now, most Chinese still aren't able to express themselves this way. This is no fault of ours because our written script is a terrifying legacy passed down to us by our ancestors. Even after years of effort expended at learning it, it's still difficult to use properly. Because of its difficulty, many people don't even bother with it, to the point that some don't even know whether the character for their surname Chang is written as Chang or Chang, or simply don't know how to write it at all, but can only say Chang. So although people can speak, only a few can hear them, and those far away have no idea what was said, so it's tantamount to being without a voice. The primary difference between the civilized and the barbarians is that the civilized have a system of writing and can use it to transmit ideas and feelings both to the masses and to posterity. So although China has a system of writing, it has now become irrelevant to the majority of the people since it uses a difficult to understand archaic language, good only for expressing ancient and obsolete ideas. All the sounds in this language are outmoded and are thus tantamount to having none at all. People are therefore unable to understand one another and are like a big platter of loose sand. And that very last sentence is one where he quotes Sun Yat-sen, Yipan, Yipan Sansha. And in terms of outmoded ideas or ancient and obsolete ideas, you know, one might also think that there are modern ideas that bear no relation to how people live. For instance, party slogans, or you know, the TIFA, the correct way in which to formulate a party slogan. Anyway, these remarks by Lu Xun are sufficient to indicate his acute self-consciousness about his use of language as, some, as someone who's steeped in the terrifying legacy, to use his words, of Wen Yan Wen. And let me comment now on what I have just quoted from Lu Xun in a critical academic register of the 21st century in English to highlight a broader in insight into language that I discern in his words. What I've learned from Lu Xun then is that language is organic. To think and speak in Chinese is to have received ways of seeing and understanding the world through received sayings of which the most influential for every person are the ones they remember best or I want to quote to others because they hear them readily in their own heads. However, if one is incapable of reflecting, reflecting on how the words that come out of one's mouth 
are effectively a bequeathed vocabulary and grammar rather than one's own words, one merely serves the dominant language, echoing what others have said, the authoritative statements of the day, for which the language, the dominant language, exists as a vehicle. One has no voice of one's own. One speaks, but is nonetheless voiceless. On this point, we should note that though Lucian encouraged others to find their own voice, he never claimed to have his own. Instead, he described himself as someone who was choked under the crushing weight of extremely ancient phantoms. Being so choked and crushed, however, also allowed him to reinvent the extremely ancient phantoms that haunted him. In his 1919 essay, How Should We Be As Fathers Today?, he made the following statement twice, first toward the start and then at the end of the essay. And those of you who've read Lucian will know this very well, this particular statement. Despite carrying an enormous burden of old customs and traditions, a person can nonetheless hold up the gate of darkness, bearing its weight on his shoulders to let the children out so that they may enter the vast and bright world beyond and lead happy lives thereafter as decent and reasonable human beings. The particular phantom Lu Xun invoked in this image of a superhuman figure holding up the gate of darkness is that of Xiong Kuohai, and sort of created as a, as a palimpsest here, that's Xiong Kuohai, who first appeared in the popular 7th century work of fiction, and Lu Xun was an aficionado of you know, popular, pre-modern popular fiction, the life stories of the Tang Dynasty, Shuo Tang Quan. So this is where Xiong Kuohai first appears. And the legend of Xiong Kuohai remains widely known to this day to readers um, and viewers, you know, because it gets recreated in martial arts movies too, of ma Chinese martial arts romances, right? Xiong is a storybook hero who led a band of outlaws at the time of the Sui Yang Emperor, um, dates 569 to 617. In Yangzhou, Xiong Kuohai and his men found themselves trapped by the imperial troops. As the story goes, an already injured Xiong gave up his life so that others could escape by propping up the thousand pound city gate on his shoulders. And there you can see him propping it up and others are sort of fleeing, right? Once his fellow rebels had slipped through, this physical giant let the gate fall on him and was crushed to death. And so this was the source of Lu Xun's statement about what we as fathers should do today. today. So Lu Xun's reference to the extremely ancient phantom, phantoms that encumbered him allows us to now imagine his inner speech as haunted by a vast repository of words and phrases, axioms and proverbs from classical Chinese, as well as lively personalities like Xiong Kuohai from pre-modern popular culture. In one sense, he sought, sought not so much to exorcise these phantoms by writing and by Huawen, because he saw that as an impossibility, hence his you know, sort of comments about, I'm choked to death by these phantoms. Instead, he strove to show how these phantoms condition Chinese habits of speech and writing as a profound legacy of China's dynastic past, profound because it was millennia old. He wrote that this pre-modern legacy meant that even modern educated Chinese like himself, the pur purveyors of modern isms, xian dai zhu yi, as he called them, as he referred to it in one instance, were incapable of experiencing something entirely new. This was because they couldn't shake the habits of their cultural past. And I remind you here of Heidegger's observation about the effects of pre-understanding that shape our everyday experience. We hear familiar noises, we hear the motorcycle, the creaking wagon. Well, we don't hear the creaking wagon. We hear the motor cars, you know. We hear smartphones. We hear people chatting away, you know, having intimate conversations, you know, on the train. Reflecting on the effects of pre-understanding in a 1926 essay, Lu Xun wrote, and again, this is something that I think um, Ya Yun also showed um, on a slide in, in his presentation um, 
this afternoon. In the 1926 essay, Lu Xun wrote, is there any place in my thinking that isn't somewhat infected by the poison of Zhuangzi? Of course, this is a well-known you know, painting of Zhuangzi and Han Feizi. I tried to find one of Han Feizi, but they all look so dour that I thought we'd stick with Zhuangzi, of oscillating between an easy manner and quickness to anger, right? And again, these sort of saying shi hen sui bian, shi hen jun qi, right? These have a kind of, you know, they have a weight, they have a sort of a gravitas. If you've been educated in the language, it resonates for you. How then did Lu Xun imagine that people might understand and hear things anew? He was mostly pessimistic about the achievements of Bai Huawen in this regard. At the time of the May 4th movement in 1919, and it's really interesting when you check the dates of his writings, his essays, against major events in Chinese, modern Chinese history. So in May 1919, you know, as there was all of this clamoring about, you know, democracy, signs, individualism, enlightenment, he had this to say. If we, if we say the proponents of new ideas are people who start fires, they will require other people to be spirited enough to fuel the flames. If we call them lute players, others will need hard strings to hear the sounds being struck. If they are sound makers, others will also need to be sound makers that they may resonate together. The Chinese are in many ways quite unlike and thus don't seek common cause among themselves. And I had great difficulty translating xianggan because xianggan, you know, refers to sort of coherence. So there's a kind of, you know, a sound wave image attached to xianggan. But that's sort of, you know, anachronistic. So I've gone with com common cause in translating this bit. Lu Xun's ample use of metaphors of sound in these remarks indicate the importance he accorded to listening as a critical skill. He implies that if Bai Hua Wen is to develop into a genuinely egalitarian language, a language belonging to everyone, then people need it to be alert as much to how they hear others as to how they are being heard by others. And the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy offers, I think, a helpful distinction between two types of auditory experiences uh, by distinguishing between hearing and listening. And I'm of course, these are synonyms, but um, philosophically, he's done something interesting in separating them so that we can think of the difference. He writes that in the act of reading a literary text, a voice resounds and does so in a manner that, in, uh, that invites both hearing and listening. In his words, whereas we never hear anything but the already coded, which we decode, and that's like the Heideggerian idea of, you know, we're already decoding what we hear. Listening is an entirely different activity. Perhaps we never listen to anything but the non-coded, what is not yet framed in a system of signifying reference. So we listen with fear, we can listen with apprehension. What's that? Okay. To hear is to have already understood what something means in the sense of ting jian, ting dong, right? Because it's already there. You know, the voices are in your head saying, yep, grab that meaning. And therefore, very important in Chinese, tinghua, right? To obey as well as to listen. Um, listening, however, is perhaps best expressed in Chinese terms of wen suo wei, wen suo wei wen, right? Uh, wen, which is the classical term for listen. Um, as in strange tales, you know, Yi Wen, for instance. Um, having figured the proponents of new ideas as fire starters, lute players, and sound makers, Lu Xun then suggested in this very same essay that people who fear new ideas, who are comfortable with the status quo, are likely to react as if these ideas threaten their lives. He wrote that this was a reaction that Chinese history had fostered. And in his words, all in all, there's nothing in Chinese history resembling an idea or principle. There are only two material properties, fire and the blade. 
It's here, Lila is their common name. So something strange is heard, you encounter something strange, Lila, you know, and then that's a kind of a reaction that you have in fear. So Lucian thus argued, argued that for the Chinese to properly understand foreign ideas as Yu, liberty, equality, pingdom, mutual help, and coexistence, they would need to first free themselves from these fear-driven cries of it's here. And this is actually from the essay, um, one of his you know, mixed impressions is Zagan, right? Which is also subtitled Shengwu, because it was this comment about how, you know, if you're Chinese, you know that that's the title that all of the uh, emperors, you know, the sort of the usurpers of the throne give themselves that they are sagely and martial, right? And um, uh, and I was going to, so in fact, I was sort of rather tempted to, um, well, not only tempted, I actually checked on the internet to see if Sheng Wu had been used in relation to Xi Jinping, but uh, not yet, not yet, but it may happen. Okay, okay. I think I will just keep on the slide for now. So let's now move to autonomy, having discussed heteronomy. How does one listen to free expression known as baihua that is yet to arrive? In his 1925 wild grass composition, The Tremor of De Debased Lines, that's my translation of it, Lu Xun presented what was arguably his most poetic and experimental depiction of a truly liberated Bai Huawen. The text consists of two dream scenarios, both of which take the form of a dream within a dream, with the second serving as a continuation of the first. So the first dreamscape is set late at night in the, <coughs> oh, excuse me, in the interior of a tightly sealed cottage. He likes these, you know, suffocating sort of, you know, spaces with dense stone crop on the roof of reflecting its state of disrepair, the dream opens with a scene lit by the glow of a kerosene lamp of two bodies pressed together. A hairy, well-built stranger lies on top of a slight and delicate body that trembles with hunger, pain, shock, humiliation, and pleasure. This suggestion of a woman forced to prostitute herself is deepened through the subsequent introduction of a hungry two-year-old girl whom the trembling woman seeks to comfort with promises of sesame cakes upon the pie man's arrival as she clutches a hard-earned silver coin in her hand. This is a very short composition um, that consists of you know, two dreamscapes, and that's the first. The second dreamscape is presented as the continuation many years later of the first. The woman described in the first dream as young but haggard with a complexion glowing like lead painted with liquid rouge has now grown old. A young couple and their offspring accuse her of wrecking their lives with the youngest child brandishing a dry reed as a make-believe sword as he shouts, kill. The narrative continues with the old man calmly leaving the cottage to walk out into the night. She keeps walking until she reaches the boundless wasteland and that surrounded by a bar barren landscape, she stands stark naked like a stone statue. She, re she recalls her entire life trembling and con convulsing at memories of, and I'm kind of running my prose and my, my words with Lu Xun's here, so these are his words, loving attachment and total estrangement, uh, ad adoration and revenge, nurture and annihilation, blessings and curses. And she then proceeds, Lu Xun again, with every ounce of her energy to raise both hands towards the sky as the language falls from her lips, both human and animal, but unlike any existing human language, wordless. In this figure of an alien tongue, yet to find the words to fully express human pain, Lu Xun offers a powerful allegory of the egalitarian ideal he envisaged for Bai Huawen. In their translation of the story, Yang Xianyi and Gladys Young gave it the English title, Tremors of Degradation. So what they had was just this Tui Bai, the Zhang Dong, right? Missing out the Xian, because it's sort of an ex 
well, doesn't sort of really make sense, you know, why have lines there? Um, and thereby reducing Lu Xun's phrase to just tremors of de degradation. However, that omission of xian, of lines, the, this character here, from the translated title makes a crucial difference to how we read the text. In effect, the, the omission reduces the text to a surreal narrative depicting human suffering, a modernist tale of the oppressed. Yet once we take into account this character, I mean, why would he have, you know, it's no accident, why did he, you know, stick this character in, right? Um, his deliberate reference to Tui Bai Xian, debased lines, the prospect of writing as language, wounded and driven into inchoate, as yet inchoate expression, assumes a pivotal importance. Lu Xun instructs us to read the anonymous woman not only as giving voice to her suffering, but as finding the capacity to do so only after leaving home to walk into the wilderness. Once the woman gives utterance to, these, to the emotions that consumed her as she stood alone in the wasteland, her wasted and decaying yet statuesque frame began to tremble. This tremble was like a myriad of quivering fish scales as each scale rose and fell like water boiling away over a hot flame. The air at once grew turbulent and became like violent storm waves crashing in a remote ocean. She then raised her eyes to the sky. Her wordless utterances ceased and silence ensued. There was only the trembling radiating like sunlight and causing the heaving air to whirl like a cyclone sweeping its way across the boundless wasteland. And you could say that, you know, that wonderful sort of lyrical passage there is entirely about resonance, right? Which is about sounds, about vibrations. If we recall Lu Xun's view of Wen Yan Wen as an outmoded language ill-equipped for common expression, what he projects in this text is a language that seeks to make itself heard across the wasteland that Wen Yan Wen has created. So this is first and foremost a language of emotional express expression, an alien tongue whose revolutionary force can only be felt but not articulated. Moreover, it can only be felt outside society, in the wasteland, or as yet unknown linguistic terrain, right? So the wasteland has all of these different connotations or can be read as having these different connotations in Lu Xun's work. It is as if the text implores the reader, listen, let this passionate human animal resonate with you, right? Hence, all of that there. Nine years later, he commented much more prosaically with optimism on the sounds of Bai Hua that he heard around him as follows. At present on the docks and government offices and on university campuses, there is already something resembling a common language, a Putonghua. What people are speaking is neither Guo Yu, the national language, nor the language of the capital, rather, they speak with the different accents and dictions of their hometowns, yet their communications are not in dialect. Although this language puts a strain on speakers and listeners alike, all the same, we can all make out what's been said. If we tidy it up a bit to help it along, it could form part of the language of the masses, and who knows, it may even end up being its main strength. Okay, so um, just think of that and then think of the Cultural Revolution and what Bai Hua Wen became, you know, during the Cultural Revolution. And, you know, you kind of, you just feel this sort of acute poignancy, you know, when you read this. Okay, so the final part, listening with Lu Xun. And what do I mean by that? In reading and rereading Lu Xun over the years, I have become more aware of hearing how his words sound in my head and of the different senses that they have made to me, contingent on time, place, and occasion. In reading him attacking Wen Yan Wen for separating the Chinese from other people by several iron walls, that's one of the things that he wrote, so iron walls, iron house, you know, that's a recurring sort of figure. I hear the extent to which his voice, as a written voice, draws from the same deep classical well that he condemns. I often hear myself 
automatically translating his Chinese into English. And I notice that these Anglophone sounds in my head carry a great deal of Yang Xianyi's and Gladys Yang's wordings of Lu Xun, for my first readings of Lu Xun were their translations of his short stories. Moreover, as my life experience has changed me, it has also altered the sayings of my inner voice, and this has also changed how Lu Xun sounds in my head when I read him now. So for large numbers of mainland Chinese of my age and older, who first read Lu Xun during the Cultural Revolution years, the changes in their sub-vocalizations of Lu Xun are undoubtedly far more dramatic. Here is how Qian Lu Chun expressed the difference between, between Maoist and post-Maoist soundings of Lu Xun during a lecture that he presented at the National Zhengzhou University in Taipei last year. We, who were the youth of the Cultural Revolution, read only Mao Zedong or Lu Xun. During the Cultural Revolution, Lu Xun was completely distorted. He became a means to an end, truly a brick to knock on the door to open other doors, truly a rock to bash people's heads in with because of sayings like da luo shui go, uh, da, yeah, luo shui go, you know, beat a drowning dog. Um, so sayings of Lu Xun or you know, wordings by Lu Xun that were sort of completely ripped out of context and then used uh, as terms of abuse, and that were then used to sort of you know, justify physically abusing other people. We were not allowed to read books other than those written by Mao, and so everyone turned to Lu Xun if they wanted a different path. This was particularly common in the later period of the Cultural Revolution. As we were all under the influence of the Cultural Revolution's earlier period, we misread Lu Xun. However, we began to reflect on our reading in the later period, and this mainly took the form of people acquiring their own independent understanding of Lu Xun. End of quote. Our inner voice is arguably the most intimate of the human voices we encounter. And yet it is also very likely the most uncanny, for the inaudible soundings it produces are both automatic, beyond our control, in the two areas of the human brain, the name for Paul Brocker and Carl Bernig. Um, that's how we, you know, that there may yet come a day when, you know, there may be a happy marriage between <clears throat> Neuro neuroscience and you know, sinology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the result of education, upbringing, and lived experience. To live with one's inner voice on automatic pilot is to hear and to decode a great deal, to recall the distinction that John Nancy makes between hearing and listening. To attempt to transcribe what one hears is the great achievement of modernist literature. <clears throat> in every language in the world, in the form of stream of consciousness representations, to attend as much to words as the sounds and rhythms they make in our heads, the musicality of language. To listen to one's inner voice is to discover that its timbre, its textures, resembles one speaking voice, yet carries a host of other people's thoughts. We are always well and truly possessed by other people's words. Um, Lu Xun dramatized the workings of inner speech to chilling effect towards the end of the true story of RQ, as RQ faced the crowd that had gathered on the execution ground. And here I quote from um, RQ. And that's a scene from the film. So Yao Yun Yu and I are uh, on the same wave wavelength. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so this is the scene. Ideas turned in his mind like a whirlwind. The young widow at her husband's grave isn't grand enough. I regret to have killed in the battle of dragon and tiger lacks impact, so that leaves steel mace in hand I shall trounce you. But when he wanted to raise his hand, he remembered that they were bound together and so did not sing steel mace in hand either. In 20 years I shall be another. In a state of panic, Aku uttered, Half a saying, and this is the bit that I've highlighted and read. 
in a state of panic, Archie uttered half a saying he had never used before, as if he somehow knew it, even though no one had taught it to him, right? And it's this idea of something that resonates, you know. The crowd's roar, good, sounded like the growl of a wolf. To listen intently is to discern beyond the known formulations of one's favorite authors and anonymous summons, how one resonates with that intimate, sonorous authority exceeds the language of logic and reason. For the soundings of conscience or liangxing, right, are often in poetry. Um, so to, you know, it's kind of, to listen, always to, to, to how things sound in your head, you know, if you do it too much, well, there's a balance that could be quite pathological, but poetically, you know, um, the things that resonate with people go beyond logic and reason. That's sort of basically what I'm trying to say here. And I, I think that, you know, again, this is something that Lu Xun um, exemplifies in his writing. And um, that these are soundings I think of something like conscience or liangxin as it's you know, known in, in Chinese. And that it is often in poetry and I think he had a sort of a keen sense of that. So let me end now by inviting you to listen to Lu Xun's 1924 prose poem. And he wrote this, Ying De Gaobie, which again, I think you're all quite familiar with. Um, the Shadow's Farewell, in which the poet pays homage to that indwelling sense of existential wonder about the point of being alive. And he wrote this at a time when, you know, there were cries of revolution everywhere, and, you know, Sun Yat-sen's KMT was, you know, sort of going, going from strength to strength, and um, the, the plans for the northern expedition were being made right, against the warlords to reunify China. So that indwelling sense of existential wonder is ineffable. But we gesture toward it when we give it such names as conscience or soul or spirit or liangxin. And that at least is how I like to read this poem by Lu Xun. And shadow rather than you know, soul or spirit it was his preferred word. So what I have there in Chinese, I shall now translate into English. And I couldn't find an appropriate sort of image to use as a palimpsest, so I've used Salvador Dali's anthropomorphic echo, which I thought sort of made sense. There is something I dislike in your heaven. I do not want to go there. There is something I dislike in your hell. I do not want to go there. There is something I dislike in your future golden world. I do not want to go there. It is you, though, that I dislike. Friend, I'll no longer follow you. I don't want to stay here. Ah, no, I don't want to. I prefer to wander in emptiness. I am entering darkness to wander in a non-place. You want a gift from me, but what can I offer you? There is simply nothing other than darkness and emptiness. I wish you nothing but darkness, though it may disappear in your daylight. I wish you only empty, emptiness because it will never possess your heart. And there I end. Mm -hmm.